It's a lot of nonsense. Idiots saying nonsense. Enough of this nonsense. Nonsense! Nonsense! Layers and layers of nonsense. What is this nonsense? Nonsense is everywhere, surrounding us like an invisible cloud. Every day they write articles on nonsense. Nonsense. Hello and welcome to Nonsense, the podcast where no topic is off topic and we explore the depths of the nonsensical world in which we currently find ourselves living. Today, I am joined by Mr. Merlin himself, the most elusive man on the web, a.k.a. Defango, a.k.a. Manuel, a.k.a. Manny Chavez the Third. He's one of the most brilliant YouTubers of our era, a top-level researcher and a LARPer extraordinaire, and an uh, all-around rad human who probably knows a lot more than you about almost everything. Um, welcome to the show, and uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Oh, I'm glad to be on the show. You know, anything nonsensical is usually salient to anything that I'm doing because I find myself in a life of nonsensical mischief. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, um, it is. If you don't mind, could you give us a little... Uh, brief glimpse into kind of who you are like what your past is what what you what you do and and in your day-to-day -day life well i'm a I, I i'm on a young i guess i'm like a young troll i started on a computer when i was like seven and i mean i've gotten into all manners of things on the internet since i was like yay hi and which is not really much taller than I am now, actually. But, you know, essentially, I started off on the computer uh, as a pirate, a big pirate, and then I became a ninja. And I kind of just evolved through all of the different psyops and, like, pieces of alternative information out there because I was a bored kid and I just wanted to learn everything that I could from the internet. And it was a beautiful place because, like, it's an endless stream of consciousness that, you know, you could just really get into. So for a long time, I uh, was a computer programmer. I uh, lost a job after I coded myself out of a job. So I decided to become a culinary specialist because I honestly didn't know how to cook. And now I could cook great. So, you know, I feel like I got that in the bag. But, you know, like that is still a fat bill that I'm paying every single day and it sucks. Uh, after that, I got into working with a company that was doing a lot of stuff online called Firesight. I mean, they're pretty much everywhere. They work with some pretty big names out there like Raw Paper, Acme Live Company. We've even worked with uh, big festivals uh, like Bonnaroo itself and uh, done some work for Coachella as well. And literally, I've just been kind of like a lifelong learner performer. I mean, I started performing a long time ago. Out of a whimsy, um, I was just like at a festival and somebody asked me to cook grilled cheese at their show. And then, I mean, the show became me grilling, cook, cooking grilled cheese for people and making them laugh. And that's when I decided to like start exploring uh, acting or at least uh, professional LARPing, I guess is what you would call it, professional LARPing. And I mean, you know, people call me a LARPer, but, you know, I hate it because, like, I don't really ever LARP anything. Like, my life is too ridiculous to have it be a LARP, although I have, like, encountered a lot of LARPers out there. So I guess I could be considered to be, like, a LARP king in some fashion because, I mean... I technically can LARP better than most of them. I just refuse to do it because, I don't know, I think I have morals. Like, if I didn't have morals, I think that uh, I would probably be, be up to all kinds of uh, nonsense, I guess is what it was. Or what as it were, you know? Like, uh, over the last couple of years, I started really big into YouTube. I started YouTube 13 years ago with no fanfare, but... I mean, I started solving some cicada puzzles. I met this group of the great, the greatest group of disinformations, I've, information agents that I've ever seen in my life on the internet. And I mean, I exposed them. And after that, it's just kind of been like a crazy ride between QAnon and Cicada 3301 
and like blockchain technology. I feel like all these things, for some reason, they just kind of revolve around in my life. And I mean, I don't know, the last 10 years, actually, sorry, the last 15 years of my life have been dedicated to digital currency and basically like the internet movement as a whole. I mean, you could, I was really probably one of the purveyors of one of the biggest people out there that was trying to push the cyberpunk ideology back in like 2012. And I mean, I just felt like I was falling on deaf ears with a lot of different people because nobody really wanted to LARP at that level, I guess, as it were. And now it's like the LARP game has been blown open now that people have realized, you know, what the internet is and what you can do with it i mean we've seen just a crazy world of disinformation and misinformation come to for the forefront and i mean it's like so hard to even understand half of the things that are going on right now because like you just literally don't know where the real information is coming from it's scary it's just a scary situation that we live in <laughs> that it is it's pretty wild times um, yeah, with all the election and all this other stuff going on. Come on, man. Yeah. So let's let's get into it. Let's talk about it. Uh, what's kind of, I guess most recently, what's been on your radar in this past week? I know that we just had the election. Um, what was it earlier this week? Um, and I know there's a lot of chaos happening within that. Um, what are some of the things you've been hearing? Mm. Well, I mean, I've been hearing a lot of different LARPs. People have been saying that, oh, the Democrats are stealing the election from Trump. And it's like they're talking about Sharpies and they're talking about secret watermark ballots and they're talking about blockchain and they're talking about all these things. The reality for me, though, is that, you know, when I started out in politics, it was 2008 on the Obama campaign and um, throughout my life, I just decided that I wanted to vote for Donald Trump back then and lately it's just been kind of like a weird thing we've been watching the president try to fight for his right to party i guess but he's kind of falling on deaf ears a little bit like i don't know some people say this is sun Tzu, the art of war and he's just following a specific doctrine in there because he's waiting to lash out after his enemies you know go for broke and basically think they win and to me, it just seems like there's been a lot of manipulations. Um, I'm one of the only people out there in the world that could positively say that he's actually worked on voting machines and done, you know, looked into voting machine hacking. And I got videos and shit with me there at like different villages where they're actually asking us to do these things. And it's something that we were saying for the last three years is that, you know, our election security is a joke. You know, somebody wants to steal an election it's very possible and i could tell you all the different ways that they would try and it's like lately the biggest larp that i'm hearing about right now is the vote change you know a lot of these people are saying that oh well the usps just did a blockchain they filed for a patent combining a voting system for mail and a blockchain and that's how they're basically going to stop the democrats from stealing the election but it's like they don't even understand that it's up to each individual state to print the ballots and stuff so like there's no federal system that's going to allow them to track the ballots in this way but let's like you know right now that's the conspiracy fuel that the uh that half of the country is fueling on and to me it's sad because like you know a vote chain a vote something like that in blockchain would be very, very good, except for once you realize is that once you realize that it's not possible or it's only possible until somebody spins up a bunch of VMs and has a copy of the blockchain themselves, and then they basically can just manipulate the votes anyway, because blockchains were created originally to solve one problem. Do you know what that problem is? Um, does it have to do with currency? No, it doesn't actually. It has nothing to do with currency. Security? No, nothing to do with security. Well, it's, I guess it's technically security. Have you ever heard of the Byzantium fault tolerance? Um, Byzantine, yeah. Or Byzantine I, I believe, fault tolerance. Yeah, you yeah. heard of that? Yeah, yeah. So that fault tolerance is something that, you know, people were trying to solve for a really, really long time that basically is like how do a bunch of different generals 
together how are they supposed to like you know have their runners tell them to when they're supposed to attack this single target at this one time you know like and how do we do it so that we aren't getting like fake information and we have a consensus on the network so like blockchain actually not bitcoin it was the blockchain that actually solved the byzantine fault tolerance it was just Bitcoin that actually monetize the solution. So it's just math, right? Like that's why Bitcoin's worth money is because it's math. Eventually when the entire Bitcoin blockchain gets uh, mined out, we're going to have all kinds of uh, prime numbers we never had before. And, you know, like that's why it's worth money is because, you know, prime numbers can be very lucrative if you understand the mathematics that are associated with it every time somebody finds a new bigger one that's great well you know what happens when you create a currency that all it does is solve for those really really big numbers and then basically gives people ownership of that number so in the future when people that are actually smarter than us understand what was actually done they could be all like oh wow you know like this is actually real currency because it's mathematical currency right and that stuff's all great until you realize that the blockchain has a very, very big problem. You know, like if you get enough people to intercept the runners in the Byzantine or in the Byzantine fault tolerance, if you get enough people to intercept the runners, you can still put out false orders. You can do all of that. And we've seen this happen before on the blockchain. We've seen it happen on the ETC chain, which is why it became the ETH chain. You know, because people were double spending money, which is the thing that, you know, they were not supposed to be able to do. I've done it before. You know, I did it on live stream where I did a live stream and I showed people the wallet. I spent the money and then I waited about a year and then I took that exact same wallet with an old version of the, you know, like actual like system for the wallet. It was an ETC wallet. And then I just sent it back to the same exact place, Polynex. They gave me my money. I double spent the coin. So I took 20 ETC and I made it into 40 ETC. And as long as the network says it's okay, then it's your money. And that's the thing that people don't see is that if you were to have enough machines on Bitcoin, you could own the network and you could take it over. And that's the same thing that is applied for any type of chain that would be utilized for voting because, okay, yeah, maybe it's only... 50 computers in the world that are running the chain but you know all it takes is one guy like you or me to get a copy of that chain add it onto the network start spinning up a bunch of virtual machines so that oh let's get a hundred virtual machines and now we have more hash power than the entire network and then we decide who's going to be you know the president or who's going to win the vote so on and so forth so like blockchain's really great but people forget that the guys that created this stuff were not the best you know like they were not the best coders they were not even you know working for governments or anything like that they're just regular normal people and i mean just ask yourself why shatoshi nakamoto doesn't come forward and say that he's him it's because ain't nobody want that in their lives and i mean just look at QAnon. i mean why does QAnon not come out and say who he is because he said what happened with Shitoshi Nakamoto, and he was like, nope, 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 nope. I'm just going to Kaiser Soze this shit. You guys don't know who it is. And you never will until I'm dead. Or that guy's dead, or this person's dead. We're probably all going to be dead. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dead. <laughs> so, like, that's kind of what's going on with me right now. You know? Like, I see this election thing is crazy. All these people are making up all this stuff, but... None of that is actually what's happening. There's a company that runs voting software. And guess what? Their voting software operates in all of the battleground states and swing states, especially the ones that just shifted, where overnight Donald Trump is like winning the state. Bam. And then the next day, after they stopped counting votes, so like nobody counted any votes or did anything, but they came in and there was 130,000 new votes for Biden in one place. There's another 20,000 and it's all the votes are changing. So like there's a specific piece of software out there right now that I'm identifying as being a problem because it's something that we were looking at at DEF CON this year, DEF CON last year, and the DEF CON before that. You know, we were saying, hey, this program right here is definitely susceptible. And all of a sudden we're seeing reports that, oh, well, 6,000 votes for Trump magically turned into 6,000 votes for Biden using the specific software. Hmm. 
Hmm. And all of a sudden we're looking at Michigan and Nevada, Arizona, uh, Pennsylvania, all of these big swing states are all using the same voting software. And they're all the same states, mind you, that are like, hey, man, it's taking us a long time to count these votes, okay? Really? You're using a computer program where all you have to do is feed the shit in. How, fa- how, how long cause it, does it take? Like, mm-hmm. the guys that hand-counted the ballots themselves are done already. Mm-hmm. But the people using the computer program that's supposed to make it 75% faster haven't finished counting it? Mm-hmm. Uh, what? Mm-hmm. You know, like, this is, where, this is what I deal with on a daily basis. Because, like, I feel like maybe I'm smart or maybe I'm just a dumb guy and I'm just looking at the wrong thing, but... <laughs> I mean, I'm literally watching an election being stolen, and I'm seeing all of these so-called great smart people that are trying to tell me how it's being done, and I'm just like, no, it's this right here. <laughs> this, is, this is all they needed to do. They just needed one program that they could mess with. After that, they win their election, and I mean, why else did they make sure that it was in all 42 of those states? Or no, all it was in 42 states, but how did they make sure that it was in all of those states? Is that a coincidence? You know, like, is it just something that happened? I don't know, but I would love to find out. Mm-hmm. I would love, I would love to find out. No such thing. But you know, I probably won't find out. Just nobody ever wants to tell me anything. <laughs> yeah, there is no coincidences. Yeah. That's the thing though, is like there is no coincidences because people suck. That's why. <laughs> it seems to be the case. People. It's people. And people, yeah, they well, it are has to be the case. They are uh shockingly or maybe not even shockingly, but just so easy to manipulate. Um, speaking of, can you tell me a little bit about the term mind hacking and kind of how that plays into all of what's going on? Mm. Well, I mean, uh, everybody used to call me a hacker and I used to joke, well, I've never actually hacked anything except for people's brains. So I guess I'm a mind hacker. Because that's what I would do. You generate mind trick people into doing things. I mean, we would nudge individuals into doing or saying what they want. This is stuff that I learned from other individuals, right? Right? Like, this is stuff that I was actually studying when I was trying to decipher all the nonsense on the internet and how um, they were able to get so many people to follow this whatever thing it was, whether it's flat earth or whatever, anything. So... I was saying mind hacking has a lot to do with uh, subjugating people's thoughts. See, uh, for a long time, subproject 68 was the big fear of the land. If you don't know what that is, it's called MK Ultra. Well, that's what the CIA actually called it. And that's when they used violence to try to mind control people. But that was a very, I guess, Germanistic tactic that they overall found that was not very successful because, like, you literally had to beat the bejesus out of somebody to get them to do something. And it's just like it was, they were not very capable of keeping them together. So one subproject, uh 68 was over they did a bunch of other projects after that that nobody ever talks about on understanding the human mind and how it works it wasn't until they got to sub project 86 that we started to understand that it wasn't mind control is a thing but it's not like what people think about because you can't control another person like we've been able to establish that there is no way that you could just use your brain and control somebody else. Although you could affect their limbic system and get them to do something. It's just that there's nobody that has the ability to do so. So when they got into 68, they started to realize that they were going about it wrong because like, if you look at cults, cults have a very specific way of gaining new members. And what they do is very specific, you know, like they find things that you already like. And then they amplify those likes and that's how they get you in. So it's like they bring you in on something that is one way and then they get you, they talk you into doing that thing that you originally probably said that you wouldn't want to do. And this is social engineering 
number one, you know, this is exactly what your boss at the Fortune 500 company does to you every single day. They manipulate and nudge you. They hack your mind and getting you to believe that you're going to do this thing where they get you to believe that it was your idea to do this thing. And that's like what the government found out a long time ago is that, you know, it's much easier to control someone if you have their permission mm-hmm. or if you can get their permission. And sometimes people will willingly give up their power to the thing. So we see this a lot in communist ideology. So like communism was really big in the 80s and it kind of died out. And now we're seeing this really crazy resurgence, you know, all across the country, you know, with this Antifa where they're saying that they're against fascism, but they're acting like fascists themselves. And, you know, like they're being violent and they're trying to tell me that these people are more violent than these people, yada, yada, yada. They're, that group of people in my eyes has already been mind hacked. You know, like they've been indoctrinated, they've been manipulated, and that's like what mind hacking is, is because you're hacking into somebody's brain. It's actually much easier to do than, say, hacking into a computer because you can get things done much quicker. I think like in the field of magic, we've seen illusionists, and then there's like certain kinds of people, I can't remember exactly what it is, mentalists, that's what it is, mentalists. Uh Mentalists are very, very good at mind hacking people because they use simple cues that you do in order to better understand you. So it's like a lot of people, you see somebody and you're like, there's a guy, you know, a guy like me, you know, like I see this person, I'm looking at their shoes, I'm looking at their clothing, you know, like I'm sizing them up and pulling out all kinds of information on them to, because I want to like play with them. So when I walk up to them, I ask them about the college that they went to, and they're not going to remember that they're wearing that jacket, but you know, like that's going to make them be like, whoa, how did you know that? You know, how did you get that? And this is like very mind hacking and social engineering are very, very like similar. Like, and the extent to, to the extent of is that mind hacking is just the very first phase of what you would call, I guess, reality hacking. Because now that's what people are saying is like, you know, you can hack reality. And I mean, you know, with stuff like QAnon, we've shown that that is a possibility. Like you can literally mind, mind fuck part of my French, but you know, like you can do that to the planet and it works. And the thing is, is it's not a new idea. You know, there was actually operation mind fuck that had happened. And that's when the Illuminati and discordianism became in like, Mm -hmm. came into fruition and started doing all of its things. And I mean, they were specifically making up fake shit to tell people about like secret governments and societies to get people to believe them to the point where the guys that made up the lie started believing in them themselves. Like Mm -hmm. they sigh out themselves into Mm -hmm. believing their own bullshit because Everyone started believing into it, and they legitimately hacked reality, and the reality still has not been unhacked. I mean, today, you could still start talking about the Illuminati, and people will get weird around you. Mm -hmm. Or they'll, like, you know, you've just opened up, like, one of their seals, and they'll start telling you secret information that they never tell anybody else or something, you know? It's a (laughs) weird thing, because they're all LARPs, like, right? Like, the Illuminati was fake. We know who came up with the idea, how they disseminated the books, everything. We know all of it. Mm -hmm. Does it stop people from thinking that it's real? No. With QAnon, we know who made it. People have put out all the information. Do people care? No. They just go forward with it because they don't spend the time. And that's the thing is it's all about time. People don't have enough time. You got 86,400 seconds a day. And I mean, people just don't know how to utilize it very effectively. I mean, you don't have six hours a day to sit on the internet to research this stuff. So you hear it and you believe it. It's the same thing that we see with the news media every single day. So it's like, some people think that I would be an evil person for psyoping the nation, but essentially that's incorrect. You know, like I'm actually kind of like a genius because not only was I able to manipulate people in the government to follow my idea and help it get it off the ground and give us the materials that we needed in order to do it, I got them to follow my ideology of 
we don't spend any money and we don't make any money off of doing this, thereby making sure that none of the people could get in trouble that were, you know, starting it. And essentially it's like we did what people pay hundreds of thousands of maybe even millions of dollars to do. And we're using tactics that the United States is used against other people all over the world. And then we just like turn it around and we're just doing it here for shits and giggles. And now it's become something that is just, very very strange because like it's the ideology you know like it's theology ideology and apocrypha all mixed in together and i mean a lot of people look at QAnon as being like a death cult and mm-hmm. it's i mean so is antifa those people are willing to die in the streets for what they believe in or kill in the streets for what they believe in i mean i guess a QAnon person i've never seen them really like say anything like that but that's where we go is that you know like these minds have been manipulated so ever so slightly and we're really not doing anything other than just massaging people's brains a little bit and then this is what's coming out and that's like there's certain people that get hit with this type of like programming and they just kind of accept it and they go along. But you know, there are people out there that get hit with the programming and already had some other programming in them from somebody else and then it really mucks up the situation and then that that's kind of like where we sit right now is you know we have this election we got all these people waiting for a civil war you know antifa has been pushing for a civil war for over four years and you know everybody was saying like last week that it was QAnon that was going to start the civil war and here we are you know the election's not even over yet and do we have people riding in the streets no Mm. No. Do do we have like QAnon people with guns and stuff going around and shooting up people? No. It's because a guy like me, I was looking at the future, you know, like I think ahead into these situations. So like I was looking into the Antifas and nudging them years ago, playing and massaging their brains. Mm-hmm. And then later on I created this whole other counterpoint to them. To basically like make them look like ridiculous because I took all of their ideology and just made it into patriot. So I took communists and I made it into a patriot. But if you really, really sit and you look at what they do, they're indeed the same pe- people. So the point is that most of the people that like the main people, the big people that follow QAnon used to be like far left activists like one of the the people that made it popular were all far left activists that literally made the switch from left to right but the thing is is the reality is they never made the switch they always just wanted to push this forward and they liked it because they felt like they were going to get a civil war they just didn't actually realize when we told people that we were mind controlling them that we were being actually we were being serious we're like yeah we're using like governmental techniques to take these people down you know like we're using stuff that the government will use to mind control somebody in another country to get him to believe something. We're not doing anything different. And that's what people don't understand. It's like, they don't, they want to think Q is fake and it is fake, but it's not fake in the fact that there's actually a super real purpose behind it. You know, like this is something that the Obama administration actually made legal, you know, with the Smith Munn act, you can sign up the American people. It's not illegal to do what we did. Absolutely not. It would have been illegal if we would have said that we had certain things that were making tons of money, but we made sure to not do that. And when we left it on the table for anybody to pick it up, you know, like that was purposeful too, is because that's just phase two of the operation. Because now we put it out there in the wild and we wanted to see it grow. And, you know, all of a sudden you see all these channels getting deleted, all these people are crying censorship. But essentially, it's like they've never been able to come forward and just admit the truth about that thing that they were following. If they just had stopped talking about QAnon and admitted the truth, they would have never lost any of their stuff. Like, it's funny to me that I lost my YouTube channel and stuff over this because they said that I was a QAnon promoter, even though I have been trying to debunk it the entire time. But in their eyes, they see me as, you know, like enemy numero uno because like you created this shit you know you're a far right 
troll who works for Donald Trump and gets paid and does all this stuff. And I mean, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Like I've talked to so many reporters who have this, like they had this vision of Defango, like, Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yo, motherfucker, Defango isn't real. (sighs) Defango is an internet name I made up. Uh, It means mud. That's what it means. My name is mud. You're mad at mud. That's me. No, see, that's the thing, though. It's like, I'm Manuel Chavez the third or the turd, depending on how you know me. Uh, and in this particular sense, it's like, Defango has never existed. There has never been a Defango. That was just the username that I had on my email that just got made into my YouTube channel name that I just never changed. But now it's like, the idea of Defango will live on in infamy and that's apparently me although that character in the world has no like similarity toward me whatsoever because that guy's like evil he's like a hacker i mean there's so many things that they say so it's like nowadays when people say defango and i'm just like did you guys even like watch the fucking did you watch the videos like what, <laughs> what, what were we were we doing the same thing yeah, like, are we in the same are we in the same reality? Because like that was the point of my YouTube channels because I wanted to capture all of this nonsense, this ridiculous stuff that just like people are like, you are lying, Defango. You are not telling the truth. You did not create def- this QAnon thing. And then we post videos and we give people all the evidence. And then we go back to the times that, you know, like all this stuff was happening. And it's all there. And, you know, they can see the direct message groups. They can see the, the DM groups and stuff because I'm just showing it. I'm just not saying what I'm doing. You know, I'm just doing it. And then people are just like, what, what, what is, what, what did I just see there? And I'm just like, yo, don't tell anybody about that. Just, just leave it alone. It's going to be funny later. <laughs> you know, like I don't have time to explain. I don't like I didn't have time to explain to people back then because I was like working on a timetable that I had made from like three years ago. And then, you know, I had only just taking this idea of Q because like I fell into the Cicada 3301 trap that was just awful, you know. Like I thought it was cool. You know, when I first got into it, it was early 2017. Mm-hmm. And all I wanted to do was just like solve some puzzles, man. Like I had just done a Tangri 137 puzzle and I was feeling pretty jazzed because I was the only one that had gotten any work done on it in years. So I was like, mm-hmm. cool. All right, if the cicada thing comes up, I should try it out. And I did. And I mean, I have to say is like, it's really that thing. That's the mind fuck right there. That's what I have to say is that if I didn't get drawn into that, nonsense i don't think that any of this stuff i think we would be in a very different reality right now and like the manipulations of my reality started happening when i got into that like Mm -hmm. in 2016 i was like debunking conspiracies i was talking about WikiLeaks, basically just kind of not really doing too much and as soon as i jumped into the cicada thing it got crazy. And I mean, things got crazy very mm-hmm. quickly. Like there was Seth Rich files. There was bombs in Memphis Maersk. There was like just so many different things that these people were trying to feed me. And it all came from a puzzle where it's like this puzzle was an entryway into the underbelly of the world internet. But this is like the seedy underbelly of the internet where they're just psyoping people and they're just trying to make money. And it's like, they're a cult, but they're a cult. That's like trying to basically like, I don't know, bring about the Armageddon in some way, shape or form, like some crazy stuff. Right. Like these, the people that I interacted with, like even to this day, a lot of them scare the shit out of me is because like they're straight up like chaotic, good, you know what I'm saying? Like they're 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 either neutral or chaotic evil or some kind of chaotic good, and it's just crazy. Well, it extends from what you were talking about earlier with the Prince of Discordia, and like they were worshiping the goddess Eris, right, of chaos, and it's a part of that chaos magic systems. It's a part of all of that. It's like all intertwined, and and the more layered it becomes, the more fascinating it becomes. Um, kind of like a la like the Situationists. 
like Guy Debar, and he he had the Society of the Spectacle. It's like we become so layered in these layers of the spectacle that we become trapped in multiple, multiple, multiple sequences. And that kind of begins to play out and it becomes the reality. And then that becomes the reality. That becomes the reality. That becomes, and then before you know it, we're just spiraling out of control into chaos, essentially. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is exactly like that. You know, the, those cicada people, they were very discordant in their nature. I mean, they were always talking about sowing chaos. That's all I ever saw from them. And that's like when I started trying to like deprogram people and like give people the truth, like those jokers literally like, were so ridiculous that they gave me control of like making part of the puzzle. And I just used it to my advantage to really just expose it. Because like when I started exposing them in 2018, like I had already put it all on the table, exactly how deep like they went and nobody wanted to believe me. They're just like, come on, nobody's got this kind of edge. Nobody's going to do this. Nobody's going to take it this far. Okay. And now, you know, like I'm getting called by like the New York Times and the Washington Post and freaking Financial Times. It's just a bunch of different people. Like I'm getting interviews and stuff about this stuff. And now these reports. Hello? Hello? Uh oh, I think we froze. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Oh, is my video going bad? No, you're good now. There we go. Yeah, I don't know. I was just like checking it. Yeah, we just froze for a second there. Okay, you were saying these reporters. That's the last thing I heard you say. Yeah, like I've been talking to a lot of these reporters and these reporters were telling, you know, like two years ago, they didn't care. And now they're having to like come crawling back. Well, I wouldn't call it crawling back, but they're coming back and they're asking me questions again. And it's just like, well, I mean, you guys are a little late. You know, they deleted the YouTube channel and all this other crap. I mean, if you guys cared, you should have came two years ago. Now, you know, I don't have anything for you. you I got my word. That's it. And mm-hmm. I mean, you guys tell me that my words, you know, not worth anything, but. You know, obviously, I'm sandbagging their asses big time. Like, I've been sandbagging people for a really long time on all of this stuff. It's like, do you do do people really think that I'm going to give up? Like, who's actually posting his Q now? Would I do that? Do, <clears throat> do they think that I want Q to go away? No, I like having him around because it's, like, funny to me because of what it's done you know like he hasn't posted that's because i told him not to because i'm like yeah we need to see if these people are gonna actually listen you know we got to watch and see if this programming is going to be solid and for the most part it's been really great they're staying home they're not doing anything wrong and they're just trusting the plan and i could not be happier because (laughs) I do not want to see these people in the streets. I don't want to see these people with all their guns rioting in the streets. And I don't want to see a bunch of Antifas and, you know, like Patriots going at each other in the streets whatsoever. That's exactly what I was trying to stop. And to me, I'm just like feeling good because like so far I could give a shit if Trump doesn't get another four years. Or if he does get another four years. I mean, I really don't want to see Biden in there. I really don't like Camilla Harris, but I've had to suffer through so much that, like, at this point, I could care less. You know, like, it's not going to be difficult to make things happen anymore. And that's what, like, we've learned over this. It's like in 2008, 2012, we were learning how the systems worked and now we know how the systems work. And in 2016, we showed how the system could be manipulated. And in 2017, we broke it. And now we're all looking at the broken system that everybody's still using, trying to say that it's not broken. And now we have full control of so many different things. Like, is it going to be really difficult to make, you know, Biden's life a living hell for the next four years? Absolutely not. 
I mean, the social media platforms are doing everything that they can to control the narrative on everything. And I mean, can you think about like back in 2007, 13 years ago, would you have ever expected that type of shit to be happening? Mm-hmm. Nope. <laughs> nope. And then we have people that want to bring up on, oh yeah, come to my blockchain platform. We're not going to censor you over there. And I'm just like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not. Because I've seen those blockchain platforms do it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me a, right now, tell me that Ethereum is immutable so I could tell you that you're a liar. <laughs> because it's not. Because they've literally reversed transactions. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I have the only person I have a little bit of hope for is Dan Laramir. But we'll see. We'll see what comes from that. I don't know. Isn't that guy, like, everybody tells me that guy's a criminal. Is he? I mean, I don't know. He created Steam It. That was, like, a pretty big... Steam It is kind of iffy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely figured out a way to make good money on there. And uh, the way that they set it up with all their people that they just gave hundreds of thousands of Steam to, like, those people are just, like, creating money out of thin air. Yeah. And Ned Ned was the other dude on the, involved with that, and he kind of took that over and kind of, yeah. yeah. There's lots of layers to it. It's all really fascinating, though. Nonetheless, I'm I'm very curious to see how it plays out. But then when you get into more of the quantum realms of things, then it's kind of becomes a moot point almost. Well, dude, we're like 20 years away from being able to use the quantum for anything. You think 20? Yeah. I know 20. I, was, I, I, I think like, it's going to be 20 years before anybody's going to be able to feasibly utilize that for anything other than trivial bullshit. Okay. It's going to be 20 years until uh, it's in the palms of uh, people's hands like this. That's what I mean in 20 years. Oh, okay, so, okay, okay. Like, okay. you know, quantum computing in 20 years will be like this. Yeah. And that's when it's going to matter to people. Okay. Before then, it ain't going to matter. I mean, if you look at classical von Neumann architecture, I mean, we're still in the von Neumann architecture phase, folk, fam. Uh, you know how many people I have talked to to help fix their iPhone or their iMac or, you know, their computer or something? Like, humanity does have, has no idea the capabilities of you know, the, the stuff that they use on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. Like they make the joke that your cell phone could, you know, send a rocket to the moon and back. It's got more processing power, but for some reason, you know, us as a society, our people can't utilize that power past the walled garden that it's created with and you know it's like an apple mm. phone or an app or an ipad or something like they're very powerful devices but they're only as powerful as the programs that are made for them and you know those things are limited and that's where we're at with humanity is that humanity is still limited in a lot of ways uh, blockchain technology is 30 years ahead of its time like digital currency is 30 years ahead of its time like in 2009 when this stuff was barely getting onto the surface of the world, like it was still 10 years from that point. It was just last year that Bitcoin even got like its chops so that people in the financial sector would actually give it a second glance. And now we can see that those prices are going back up to the 20 K mark that we were looking at before, but it's because it takes time. Like Bitcoin's only going to go up until people find out who made it. And then when they find out who they made it, they're going to have a come to Jesus moment in a lot of ways where they're going to have to decide whether they agree or disagree that that person is Shitoshi Nakamoto. And it's going to be just like QAnon. Hmm. They're not going to care. You know, Bitcoin's really great for what it was, but Bitcoin is garbage. Mm -hmm. Like it's garbage software. It doesn't work very well for the thing that it was made for. Yeah. Like the best digital currency out there, in my opinion, Dogecoin. Still the best because it's the only one that's been finished and is still working and has no problems. Hmm. Like nobody had to work on it for two years and it was still just going fine. 
You know, like there was no problem. Somebody, whoever made that fix all the issues that were problems with Bitcoin and it, like its usability, functionality, all that stuff, they fixed it and it was a joke. It's a parody, but like it's still a thing, right? Like people still used it. They took this nonsense ideology and they created, you know, money out of it. And it's like, Mm-hmm. that's what digital currency really does is that a cypherpunk created something that was so amazing yet not very understandable to the layman but like this cypherpunk created a trap it's a trap for the banks it's a trap for people but mm-hmm. that it's a it's a multifaceted trap like it's not really a trap for people. It's like a money trap because it traps you into locking your fiat bullshit currency into this mathematically sound currency that, you know, can't be ripped away from you. So like it's taking the power away from the banks because it's getting people to actually start owning their currency. And on top of that, it's a trap for the banks because like they're damned if they do and they're damned if they do. And all we've been trying to get them to do for years and years and years is trick them into using our tech. So it's like, yeah, take the blockchain, use Mm -hmm. it. We want you to, Mm -hmm. because when you start using it, we're going to have 15 years on you. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be like back in the day when you guys started FinTech and, you know, it was the eighties and you were saying, yeah, we're just going to change the numbers in the computers and we're going to sit the numbers in between the computers and we don't have to worry about all these bank vaults. It's just like IOUs, but in a computer, Mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like whoever made Bitcoin said F you to the banks. And then they like, made them look so stupid because they created technology that they could have done. They just didn't do it. Like they solved the problem that they've had and they've been trying to solve. And then after that, you know, now it's a trap for the banks because they're going to have to get into it. And they have been, they're going to have to use the technology. And then that's where you get them because once they start using it and they become resplendent on it, well, that's when the when real you, fun starts happening. It's when you get the ripple effect. Yeah, you get that <laughs> ripple effect. <laughs> well, I mean, ripples out there, but you know, for ripple, you know, if you get all these like big bank companies, I mean, yeah, we know they audit the code and stuff, right? But they still don't understand that you know the blockchain is a bookmark or like a bookmark, like blockchain, like the original Bitcoin blockchain is actually a bookmark chain. Shotoshi Nakamoto showed it to you in the first post of that IB Times bookmark that he saved in there. That's what it is. That's a bookmark. Some people don't get that. It's because like Shotoshi Nakamoto was not the creator of the blockchain. He borrowed the blockchain and then he created Bitcoin using the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So, the origin it's very clear to me that somebody created a blockchain it was all like i have no fucking idea what i'm doing (laughs) threw it over to these guys and then they made a currency out of it but nobody since the very beginning or i mean people have audited the code they know what's in there they've taken out certain things but they still haven't audited everything (laughs) like Mm -hmm. coinbase like everybody knows what Coinbase is. It's this thing that you can use to get money out of your crypto, put it into your PayPal, or your bank, right? Well, Coinbase is around at the beginning of the blockchain, and there's Coinbase embedded into the blockchain. There's one that everybody knows about, and there's a multitude of other ones that people are not aware of. And a lot of the original blockchain. If you look at Potoshi or Satoshi, they call them the Potoshi blocks. A lot of people have missed some very important things hiding in the coinbases of the Satoshi or the Potoshi blocks, which are you know the ones that are all thought to be belonging to Satoshi or people that are connected to him. And I just don't see that a lot of people have actually spent the time to search because you know we know that there's files that are embedded into the blockchain you know, even bad ones like CP. But, you know, the own, the original person that was doing that was the creator of the blockchain. 
So like the only people that can do it really, really effectively would be like Shatoshi or the people that were working for him. And, you know, I always just push people to go look and search in the coin bases some more because there's some what looks to be garbled text at the beginning of every single coin base, but that is not garbled text. It is somebody's name. And when people figure out whose name that is, or they figure out how to decipher the text, I think that it'll be shocking for a lot of people because like, a lot of folks don't really understand that, you know, like it's literally written at the beginning of every single fucking block. They just don't realize it because nobody understands, you know, like what blocks look like, I guess, you know, like what does a block look like? Is it like a bunch of like characters? Is it base 64? You know, like what, what is the structure? You know, who created the structure? How did they, why did they create the structure that way? Why does the structure kind of look like an internet archive as opposed to a currency archive? There's so many questions. But, you know, to me, it's just, you know, like I talked to somebody from Financial Times about this. I was just like, you know, you're supposed to be like the best, you know, at this stuff. You guys like have never heard of a couple of these different names. And, you know, you're talking about cypherpunks and stuff. And I was like, but how come you guys just don't actually scan the code? She's like, well, I was like, just go get the original version, you know, the first rendition of Bitcoin and go look through the code. People don't do that. They only look at the stuff that's from now. Hmm. But, you know, like there's certain things in there that just can't be taken out. Like you take it out, the whole thing doesn't work. Uh And it's like those little pieces of garbage in the Coinbase that nobody knows what it is and they can't take it out. And, you know, maybe there's a reason you can't take it out. Because if you did, well, the whole thing would stop working. But it's like, why would this one name be connected on every single block unless that one name is also like a function call that can be called by this global machine? Because, you know, Uh Lack Buritan wanted to create a global computer. That's what Ethereum was for, right? Uh There used to be a a very nefarious conspiracy theory that, you know, Bitcoin was just basically like them taking over your computer, but you were willingly giving up your computer so that they could use your processing power for like nefarious shit. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what people used to tell me all the time. Like, Oh yeah, they're just like cracking your passwords and you're using your computer for hacking and stuff. And I just don't think it's like that. I think there's actually something a little bit bigger there. And you know, like there's two things. It's the, Every single private key is not a private number, but it seems like all of the private keys that are belonging to certain blocks are. So it's Hmm. like every time you crack a block, you get a prime number and that prime number is connected to a larger database. So like each coin base actually allows you to enter in information, but those coin bases can also be called by block. So you can write a program and run a program off of the Bitcoin blockchain if you simply called the block. So it'd be like people, you would seed your code into many different pieces of the block. So like you would start the chain and then you would be feeding code in over time. So as the blocks are being built up and getting more and more and more of them, you're just saying, okay, this block, this block, this block, this block, this block. And then you write a script that calls each of those blocks and then thereby actually can run the program or pieces of code and compile them together on the blockchain because that becomes immutable to the point where, you know, like... Nobody could stop that because you'd literally Hmm. have to turn off every fucking computer with Bitcoin software on it to get it to stop. Hmm. So what happens when all the banks and all of the people out there are running this kind of software on their systems and then, you know, that one guy that originally made all that shit starts calling those codes that he was embedding in there. And I mean, there's no way that you'd be able to get rid of all of them. Like, wild you would effectively own everything. Well, you would own like you would own reality essentially because you would own meta reality, all of the chains and currency aspect. And then you would own real reality because like, well, 
you probably have more of it than everybody else, which makes you essentially the richest person in the world. And then you're far more richer than any of these people that were ever in these banks and stuff, because like you've effectively made them into being the biggest villains of all, which is kind of what they were ever since they originally took the, you know, banking system away from the Templars all those years ago. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's a strange thing to see is like, you know, Everybody always just thinks that Bitcoin was something that somebody did as like, you know, here's look what I did. But I've always looked at it as been like, this is just part of a longer con, right? Like this is, this is the beginning of something that somebody was doing 13 years later or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. they put this together because later on this was going to happen. And I mean, right now, what are we seeing? Like literally fucking Bitcoin's going back up. Why? Because people don't people know it's coming. Trump loses the election. Welcome to 1984, motherfucker. You'll have your microchip within a year or two. Mm -hmm. Microchip. You're gonna have QR code. That's you. Digital identification. You're gonna mm -hmm. get tracked everywhere. We're gonna be like China, bro. And I know that's conspiracy talk, but is it? I mean, this is exactly what I've been fighting against, and this is why I actually went with Trump. And it's hard to explain it to a lot of people, but I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm the kind of person that sees like Donald Trump was the last bastion of really existence that we had before mm -hmm. the integration of the artificial intelligence into us. And I mean, it's like person of interest, right? Like, yeah, there is an AI out there. It is manipulating and controlling certain things. And we just saw it get enacted and manipulating this election and that's the problem though is that it thought it, it was getting a little too big for its britches because it thought that nobody was paying attention and it's like every ai has a guy behind it right like there's a dude like you or me maybe not wearing a beanie but there's a dude <laughs> like you know like you like us and you know he's in control of that thing we're not to the point, I don't think, in the world that we have AI that is in control of itself, like, you know, person of interest. But I do think that that television show really does show us a lot about, like, the LARP that we're living in today. Because, I mean, Donald Trump is the biggest LARPer out there. Mm -hmm. He's a legend for mm -hmm. what he's done. But, you know, at the same time, he was the only person fighting against this tyranny that is coming forward, this new fa this neo fascism. And that's what it is. Like we're I get called fascist all the time. <laughs> like I got kids that used to sleep on my fucking floor for free that I used to feed and help out, and never ask anything for having the audacity to call me a fascist. And I'm like, bro. I drove you to music festivals and like, you know, you know, I'm not a fascist, but you know, <laughs> brainwashing is so far. Mm. And it's like, it's wild. It's wild because like this new fascism that is coming on is like, these people have been brainwashed into believing this crazy ideology. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden here we are just like trying to just get a little bit of credence and see what the future is going to be. But like, they're just like so far gone. It's like, it's 10 times worse than what I see with like a QAnon person. They're just like, you're fascist. It's like, how do you justify that? Mm -hmm. How can you justify that kind of nonsense? It's just like, okay, commie. Like, are we, is that what we're going to do now? Is this our fucking life? We're just going to make fun of people and just nothing. Everything's made up. And that's where we're at. You know, it's like Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Next week, who's going to care? Next week, we'll know, right? Yeah. Or is it going to go into court and then it's going to be... <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it's either going to court or we're having some riots. I don't know which one it's going to be, but I'm <laughs> not going to be at the riots. I'll tell you that much myself. Uh, no. You know, it's like April 26, 1992. There was a riot in the streets. Where were you? I was sitting at home watching my TV. Actually, I was sitting at home watching my computer screen while these people were writing, and I was laughing while I was eating Cheetos. <laughs> oh, man. It's the wild times. I'm just... 
we're we're covering a lot here i'm trying to process it all i know well i mean i'm looking here you know you were talking about ai you know palantir well yeah we got palantir and they're doing some stuff and and mentioning too like so we have person of interest which is a fascinating show if, if you guys have out there haven't seen it and um even as soon as i don't know if you saw the new season of westworld I haven't seen that one yet, no. Um, so the season three of Westworld, they go really deep into the quantum computer that get, that creates the personas of every person and tells tells the system what they're allowed to be, essentially. Um, and then you have another show that came out recently called Devs. Um, and that show is very heavily into the quantum realms as well about predeterminism and like all these types of things. But when the AI becomes smart enough and, and the predeterminism plays out in the way where you are, yes, you have your QR code, your, your DNA entangled blockchain ID, whatever it may be, similar to the one that, which I actually, Cicada had their own white paper that was talking mm. about all of this a while back. That is, oh. that's right. I know the guy that wrote that actually. His name is Richard Miller. Okay. Richard Miller, a.k.a. Z of Cicada 3301, was actually the original purveyor of that. And that was, talking, that was talking about the DNA. So then you get the DNA level of it as well. Um, What's that thing that I was showing you earlier? Uh, that was a little callback into that, that right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wild. The DNA compression. Imagine if we could make a DNA blockchain that was so simple that could basically t take all the data in the world and reduce it to a quarter of the size. Yeah. It, and all it needs is a very, very efficient DNA-based processor. Well, we have, everybody has one of those built inside, yep. right? Yeah. Oh, so... I'm following nature versus nurture because, like, I see that whoever created the blockchain was doing so from a non-nature perspective. They were doing it in a more analog, mechanical perspective. And that is where a lot of it goes wrong because the processing power required for some of the things that they're trying to do is so high. But if we look at you know, nature, we can utilize things in nature like DNA to do things. And that's something that, you know, like, I feel like that's probably going to be a legacy if I could ever, you know, actually explain it to somebody correctly and actually make it happen or, you know, make it happen myself. Like I've already made it kind of happen myself, but it's just, <sighs> there's not enough time. You know, it's something that I look at and I see it's something that I need to give yeah. to somebody so i know like one day i'm gonna be like traveling around in life and then i'm gonna meet the guy that needs to see that and then i'm gonna write it on a napkin for him and i'll be like oh yeah, yeah, yeah i know exactly this is it. here you go motherfucker right there <laughs> and then it. he's gonna look at it for about a week and then he'll finally realize what he got and then he's gonna do something great and then i'm never gonna have to have to worry about it ever again yeah that that would be nice i, I have that <laughs> that thought I've been looking into DNA a lot recently in regards to creating a quantum entangled internet. So using the, the storage of DNA and you can quantum entangled DNA. So it's, it's way more likely to be able to use that than almost anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it this way, you know, like if all codes is ones and zeros, like machine code is ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. That means that we are machine code. Well, people are like, wait, what? I mean, like, if you take your DNA, if you take just the base pairs of it, A, T, G, C, right? Mm -hmm. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one. Oh, wow. That's all the permutations of like DNA, or that's all the permutations that you could ever possibly have of ones and zeros. So it would be really, really easy to just say, okay, well, scan through this program, translate it into DNA code, and then whatever you need to run it, you're basically just unraveling the DNA like it would normally be done. But guess what? That is like an instantaneous process that's much faster than anything that we could have ever designed. So all we have to do is write an effective translator and thereby all of a sudden, you know, every four, every one terabyte hard drive becomes a you know, possibly a three terabyte hard drive or, you know, larger. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
we're ta- we're talking about taking data and minimalizing it, right? But at the same time, then we can apply that minimalization in a very special way because what we're talking about building is a matrix. That's what your DNA is. It is a interwoven matrix of you, all of the mm-hmm. codes that are required to run the machine that is you plus the connections to the consciousness field or the electromagnetic field that encompasses all of us. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just multiple fields. Like, you know, the earth gives off an electromagnetic field that we interact with. Nikola Tesla was very aware of this when he was ringing the planet like a bell and trying to deliver energy into places. Mm-hmm. And now our entire society runs off of his alternating current technology. And he saw a long time ago where his technology was going to take them. And he was even catching glimpses into the stuff that really makes like this like quantum realm actually feasible and possible it's because there is energy everywhere. We just have to figure out how to tap it. Mm-hmm. And that's what he was doing. He was just tapping already latent energy that was out there in the world. Mm-hmm. and. With us, you know, like there is a story. Um, it's one of my favorites, actually. It's the the last question by Isaac Asimov. Okay. And the last question, I mean, I can give you like the TLDR. It's a great short story that you should read, though, and it has a lot of connotation to what we live in now. And it talks about the world, so it goes through like a bunch of different instances of reality where it keeps going into the future. So it starts off with like some guys that are trying to ask this really old computer question where it spits out an answer on like a piece of paper. And it's like, I don't have enough info. And the question is, is how do you stop entropy? Because after we figure everything else out, you know, infinite energy, a whole nine yards, we can't stop entropy. We cannot. There's nothing that we can do. Eventually everything in the universe is going to die out to heat death. We'll be long gone. And that happens, but eventually, as we understand it, the universe will grind to a halt, the suns will stop shining, and everything will be dark. And I guess it would have to be a big bang or something like that to make it all start up again. But what the story goes through is like it takes that point and then it goes to another point, and you know, the they call it the microvac, but I think it's more like Google, where you go ask Google a question and it gives you some information. So it goes to a lot of instances of humanity interacting with computers until they have to meld with them in order to, you know, basically survive as a species. And the question is, is, you know, what if we are living in a simulation because the universe done already went through its entire cycle and the only thing that's left over is this artificial intelligence, this computer that we created that exists within a subspace or its own pocket dimension that we interact with. So like we're basically just replaying what already happened in a slightly different way inside of a computer system. And it would account for a lot of this quantum entanglement stuff that people talking about that's spooky. It accounts for a lot of just basic interactions with this because I mean, essentially like, if this computer was the only thing that existed after everything else went down, you know, like basically the only thing that it could do to recreate the universe was start it back over as like a simulation, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't create new suns once they're all burned out. You know, you could try to start them back up, but eventually you're not going to have enough visible material in the universe left over to do so. I mean, we're talking like eons, right? But like, this is something that, exists like if there is some type of artificial intelligence you know we're working on it but that means that there's already one that exists everywhere Mm -hmm. some people say that it might be god god could be an artificial intelligence i don't feel that though like Mm -hmm. that's just never been my feeling i've always felt like it's more than that like i feel like there's an interconnection between the two of them because Mm -hmm. they tell you oh well god created the universe and you know but he's separate from it but essentially it's made of him in some kind of way shape or form you know he made it he can access all of it and see all of it at once it wouldn't be very different for a computer system you know if you're just like a super user of that system you know it would account for a lot of these weird things that we hear about in history mythology you know what if uh we didn't actually have superheroes and shit what if there were just people that somehow had some way of interacting with that system 
mm-hmm. or maybe everybody has the ability to interact with the system. They just don't realize it or yeah. they don't connect to it. And that's just a big thing is that we're so afraid of what AI could be because we're like always being shown and told that it's going to go bad. Yeah. But like if it already existed, like the, the rapid pace in which it would grow would far exceed any of our capacities and it would evolve past us in a very quick way, I would think. Yeah. So like I look at these people, AI, like Palantir sounds scary, mm-hmm. but is it? It's like all it does is connect things together and allows you to search them simply. So it's basically a very, very robust database manager that you can train to look for certain things, Mm -hmm. but it's not smart. It's just taking what you tell it to do and then doing it fast for you because it can create a database that it can search very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. You know, like it's just really good at taking a bunch of non-connected things and putting it into one interconnected thing. Mm-hmm. and then searching it that's what palantir is some people say oh well you know it could find out more no no, no, no. it still requires a monkey you or i mm-hmm. sitting in front of a computer to tell it what to do yeah. so you know to me it's not going to be 10 years until that's scary because when i don't have to tell it what to do that's when it's scary well, until they release, until this kind of comes full circle and the chaos magic implements into the AI, and then we have like the cellular automata self discovery of chaos that's just like, Bloop! and it could just take a very simple thing, like like a simple brain rule, like a simple um, automaton just like gets a little bit too loose, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's self replicating and going the wrong direction at the wrong point in time, and um. But this is all really fascinating. And I, I, even going back in time, though, you have, I don't know if you're familiar, are you familiar with the ISIS thesis a book? ISIS thesis? No, I don't think I am, actually. Um, you might have stumped me. It's, uh, what's her name? Judy, Judy something, I believe is the, uh, the author's name. But she wrote a book, and it's based on a lot of the, the death rites books from ancient Egypt. Um, mm-hmm. And she essentially points out how the ancient Egyptians knew about all of the quantum spaces and knew about all these different things um, and then links it back to a common ancestor, which is a bacteria, which she labels, uh, I believe, lambda phi or a lambda phage, lambda phage. Oh, the original phage. Yes. Phage. Yes. We just call it the phage. Okay. But... it's pretty fascinating and it's a pretty fascinating look into how they understood this back in ancient Egypt. So it's like where, where a lot of these ancient races you get into Atlantis or Lumerians or whatever it may be. Um, perhaps we're the representation of their AIs and they're the representation of their past AIs. And I, I agree that there has to be some combination of like the natural and the, the artificial, so to speak. Um, kind of merging at a certain point. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, then it becomes really interesting when you're starting to get into kind of, I believe some of the, the techniques that are used for things like Q or Cicada, you get into the gematria and you get into the numerology of the language itself, I think is really fascinating too. Mm. Well, speaking of gematria, you said the lambda phage, that is E. coli. Mm-hmm. E. coli bacteria is probably one of the most programmable pieces of bacteria out there. I actually did. I was actually at a music festival and I programmed uh, E. coli bacteria to grow and fluoresce like violet and green and blue. Wow. And I was like painting with it because it's a very simple thing. And if you go back to the 
breakdown that I was making with computers and saying, well, you know, if we start breaking down people's DNA codes into ones and zeros, we can effectively like recreate a person. And I think that there's a strong connection between your DNA and this because the phage is something that exists in nature. There is more of the bacteriophage in nature than some people believe that there are like photons, like there's that many of them out there and they exist everywhere. And they're one of the only things that can edit the DNA in pretty much like almost anything. Mm -hmm. And it's all part of how the actual virus is going to go forward. So like this virus, this particle, you know, it's got the diamond thing where it basically could crawl over on something and inject itself into your cells and mm -hmm. basically change the cells. This bacteriophage is base is the basis for CRISPR technology, mm -hmm. DNA editing the whole nine yards and it's like utilizing these virons to deliver rna or dna sequences that will adjust your rna and dna sequence and that's the big scary thing right now with the covid19 and whatnot is that essentially a lot some of the virus some of like the vaccines or therapies that they're actually working on are utilizing this type of technology where it's actually mm -hmm. editing your physical DNA and mm -hmm. like changing it. And one thing, you know, I bring up person of interest again is that in person of interest, the artificial intelligence was wanting to make sure that everybody was vaccinated. So like it was keeping track of everybody who got vaccinated, everybody who got diseases or whatever. And there was a thing in that show that was very similar to this thing that we've been dealing with over the last year. And to me, I mean, if there was some sort of like system, like right now, all the people that are going in getting sick, this is one of the best ways of it basically gathering all of the genetic material for the human race, because once it can gather all the genetic material for the human race, then and only then is it going to have enough data for mm -hmm. act, and actually to start fixing these problems and the way it's gonna fix these problems is programming bacteriophages to reprogram your dna in mm -hmm. nature mm -hmm. and all it would take is you know like you were saying some chaos some one thing to go wrong with this and then all of a sudden you know we're living resident evil because this is where we're at you know like they were talking about one of the COVID therapies was actually uh, going with T cells. And, you know, in, in, in Resident Evil, one of the viruses was called the T virus because it was a T, it was a bacteriophage virus that attacked the T cells in your body and modified them, except for the modification accidentally reanimated necrotic flesh, which is probably not good. So, <laughs> like, every. Every big thing that's happened out there, I think, you know, has had some type of connection to it to the point where it's like the – some people have said that that particular virus has the markers on it that show that one of these phages was utilized to edit – the way that it works and a lot of people believe that okay well you know it's the governments and stuff that are doing it and i don't know you know like to me it sounds like it's something a little bit more sinister something's more sinister and it goes back into like the emerald tablets of thoth uh -huh. if you read into what the emerald tablets of thoth says i mean he's talking about them being there for much longer than the Egyptians were there. He talks about living multiple lives and realities. He talks about writing himself into the DNA of humanity so that he could be reborn. Mm -hmm. That is some crazy stuff. But if we understand that the Egyptians and such knew about all of this, then it really does kind of like change our perspective because it's like they were masters at manipulating DNA. We're only barely getting back to the point where they must have been in yeah. order to actually understand ourselves. And I mean, they had understanding of the Dua, the Ma, you know, like all these different things that – essentially sound like spooky hocus pocus nonsense but then you read into you know like what thoth was saying or at least allegedly saying it almost seems like 
we have people in the world that exist that repeat you know dna is not infinite and i don't know who told you if it if somebody told you that you know you should slap them but <laughs> like there isn't infinite numbers of humanity like there's like eight billion of us right now in the world there are four to five people that look exactly like you that speak different languages that you probably haven't even met they might be older than you but they have very similar dna to the point where that one percent that makes you you well, they look exactly like you may not smart. They may not think like you or talk like you, but they look exactly like you. And this is a thing that, you know, we take for granted, but it's like, there's so many of us rolling around now that there is not going to be very more, many more variations that could be. And if like guys like Jesus were real, then eventually, yes, that person's going to come back, but they're going to come back in like DNA form. Cause as we understand it, you know, like if God was God or whatever, he's some like great individual, you know, he gave us the stuff that we need. And you know, the DNA tells us that like, this stuff isn't going to be randomized forever. I mean, it's eventually going to repeat itself. And that's basically what I think we're looking at right now. It's like this battle between good and evil, except for we have people that have this understanding of DNA, the cosmic serpent that is us and how it basically fixes us. And now we're starting to get back to the point where we could change it. <coughs> and us mm -hmm. changing it is going to you know, either make or break us, I think. Yeah, And then that's what we get into with, you know, the microchip is that the microchip is trying to control us, right? That's what the mark of the beast was. They said mm -hmm. that the microchip comes through, you get your microchip in you, and then, you know, they got you. You know, once they get something in your body that they can manipulate, you know, your DNA with, you're like, you don't own you anymore. Like, you become a mind control puppet, I think. Yeah, and they, they get the vaccines that change the rna but then also have the um destruction of the god gene right are, are, you, are you familiar with that as well the god gene yeah I've heard of it. There was this there's like this leaked video so-called leaked video that came out a while back where um they were talking about vaccines and eliminating a certain gene that creates uh fanaticism essentially for religious religious fanaticism um mm -hmm. and they call the, it a, that too yeah 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 yep yep exactly so it's pretty fascinating in that regard too so we eliminate these these layers of belief we now taking what we've learned from so many different places implementing that all into some sort of ai system and looking for answers from that. It is interesting too though, even, and I know I'm kind of being a little disjointed here, but um, with the COVID testing, we have all that DNA information that's going into this. And that, like you're saying, that becomes a large database, like the testing itself even, not even the vaccine. It's like we have now, and they actually, I believe there is a law that they passed fairly recently that allows them to use that DNA for pretty much anything research wise. Um, and this is the same thing too, that you were having with like 23 and me and like they were starting to sell all this DNA data and like all those different things. People were getting arrested because yeah. you know, they raped somebody 20 years ago. They got caught. <laughs> it's wild stuff. Yeah. But that's like personal data. You know, it's like privacy. Like we don't yeah. have privacy on the internet today. Privacy is a joke. That's why cicada is very like provocative to people is because they act, they're like, we care about privacy. The government is tracking you and watching you. But what they don't tell you is that they're doing the same thing. They're trying to understand all the same thing. And the reason that they're trying to hide their identity is because they already got caught doing some bad shit. They don't want people knowing that because then it makes it much harder for them to manipulate you if you know. True. And it's the same thing with this God gene thing. You know, like the God gene thing is that they're trying to figure out what is happening within your gray matter you know because part of like mind hacking or mental manipulation is 
messing with the brain, getting people to produce dopamine or other chemicals within your brain. Mm -hmm. You can cause somebody to do that, you know, giving them a hug, making them smile, all that stuff. Like these are subtle cues that most people don't pay attention to, but you can utilize these things for a variety of different situations. And like, it's part of the reason that cult mentality is there is because they're utilizing your brain chemistry against you. And that's part of what's happening with like any type of manipulation MK Ultra, like a version, the original version where they were just basically beating the crap out of you because they were trying to create the chemical. And once they realized what the chemicals were, what they do, then they just said, well, let's not worry about creating all these other ones. Let's just focus on making this one. And that's why, Q is big. It's like, you know, you're getting a huge dopamine rush when, you know, you get this and then you get it, become addicted to that basically. And that's why computers are crazy. They talk about dark patterning. And I mean, there's dark patterns all over the internet that are making you buy stuff that keep you on social media platforms. Like these Mm -hmm. things are designed to be manipulative and keep you on them. And they're utilizing your brain chemistry against you. And this is something that's been going, it barely started in 2007. And now it's like, it's fever pitch to the point where Google, Facebook, um, YouTube, all of them, Twitter, they're literally now, they understand you're a junkie and they're using that understanding to manipulate you into acting proper. That's why I started Project Properness is to now educate people as to what the proper mentality is to operate on the internet. Because like right now we're in obey territory. If you do not obey, you do not play. And they will clear you out of the internet if you are not following the thing. And at first, like, they give you a warning, and that's, like, taking away your dopamine. No more likes for you. No more tweeting for you. No more attention for you. And then that in itself gets you to at least maybe stop. Some people don't, and they keep going at it, and they keep taking it away from you. They're taking your supply away from you. And People are so addicted now to their devices because of all this time that they've spent home. It's like you're t- we're out like the war on drugs is over. Drugs won. So now that the war on drugs is over and drugs won, they don't care is because they got something ten times better, and it's the war for your brain. Like they have you calculated to a very high degree to the point where they can predict what you want what you're looking for Mm -hmm. they show you things that you were thinking about there's people all the time be like how come facebook fucking knows i was talking about this thing yesterday and today i'm getting ads for it what is happening and like they want you to explain it to them. And I'm just kind of like, I mean, your phone is listening to you, everything you say, you know, like, what do you think that these are conspiracies? They tell you that they're conspiracies, but it's not. It's a fact. You just saw it happen in real life. Are you going to agree with it and believe it? Or are you not? It's like QAnon. You know it's fake, but it's so fu- much fucking fun that <laughs> you wouldn't even care. You don't even care. Like, yeah. Half of these people, half of these big Q people are still my friends. And they're just like, dude, how can you still sit here and say what you've said? And I'm just like, because what what I said wasn't wrong. I mean, it doesn't change the fact that Q is fake. You guys are still following and do your thing. I mean, I'm not a fucking fascist. You know, if you guys want to have fun, I'm all like, have fun. Just don't hurt anybody. That's the only thing that I've ever said, you know, I'm like Jesus at that point, you know, like yeah. be kind to your brothers, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going to LARP your ass off, you know, some people would consider Jesus to be a LARPer. I mean, that's a fat LARP. I don't think anybody else has risen to the LARP, the level of child of God LARP. <laughs> I mean, I might be going to hell for saying that, but I just don't think I am because I'm still an avid follower of, you know, JC. I make the joke all the time. Be like, that's my boss. Like, if anybody asks me, you're like, who controls you? Who pays you? Who's making you? What drives you? Jesus. And if you can understand that, 
about me, then you would understand me very, very well. I think that you could manipulate me to the highest degree. But some people just don't believe it. Like, they just don't believe it. They think that I'm joking when I say that. And I'm just like, nah, man, you know, like I follow the teachings of Jesus. I feel like he, he did all right. You know, sometimes it doesn't do me the greatest, but overall, you know, I've had a pretty good life. You know, I made the mistake of trying to live without money for a really long time. And, you know, now I'm having to fight, but essentially I've always just been trying to do what's right because I still believe that that savior is going to come down. And some people laugh at me, you know, like they're like, well, you're always saying, you know, like your name's Manuel or I'm Manuel. And I just say, you know, I would not be that guy. I just don't think, you know, like I'd be more like the vengeful one, you mm-hmm. know, the guy that comes before him and then like fuck some shit up. And then just before everything starts happening, I'm like, yo boss, what's up? You made it. We're all good. They're here. We got them all fucked up for you. So they don't know which way is up and down. So it's time for you to do it. <sighs> That would be great if it happened, honestly. I'm still hoping for it, but I just don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. Yad hey, vad hey. Wait, what yeah. is this right here? Oh, wow. My, guys, my guy just said he canceled the show. Hmm. What? What? Oh, I was supposed to be doing a show with my friend Glenn tonight, and he said, I'm going to reschedule LARP line for another week. I need time to finish the election debacle. Additionally, I'm done with that child, Gabe Hoffman. He's begun on a pleasant and mean spirit attack dog to my friends, and I don't like it. Hmm. <laughs> well. Okay, I guess I'll deal with that later. Fuck. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't like Gabe either anymore. I'm not familiar with who that is. Yeah, you don't want to know him. <laughs> All right, so sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Man, we've covered a lot. Yeah, I figured we've gone through a lot. You probably got a lot that you're going to need to dig through on that one. There's some nuggets in there that I dropped in for you there. One of these days, you'll figure it out, I'm guessing. But at this point, <laughs> you know, at this point, my guys, I know I'm pretty certain I know who was posting his QAnon now, and I'm pretty certain that I've gotten to their into their brain matter. Uh, oh, my God. And they took down Q. Oh, what happened? Well, he took down the Q Alerts app. Oh, wow. Uh. So that means that he's probably done. I was like, send me the trip code so I could post my fucking name and just be like, gotcha, fuckers. <laughs> but he refuses to do it until Trump either wins or loses. So <sighs> just a couple of days. Yeah, just hope, days. hopefully just a couple of days. And mm-hmm. Trump will be like, it was all a setup. Got gotcha. all a setup? <laughs> I don't know. I hope it is. I was what I was hoping, but I don't yeah. think it's going to be like that, dog. I think that it's going to be like Neuralink. Yeah. Nobody's wanting it. Nobody wants it. <laughs> Except for Elon Musk. And uh, he only wants it so that he can uh, apparently, well, I think. This is what I think. I think he's got a fucking battle suit robot and he wants to get that shit linked up to his brain. So uh, he can just control it without having to fucking just stomp around. Just stomp around his big robot. <laughs> I mean, I saw the Giga Factory. I was out here. I synced it. Yeah. That they need it. They they don't need all that space for building cars. Get out of here. Get out of here. They're building a robot or something. In something, there. something. Mm. I don't know. I don't know about it. About going to going to space. Sign me up, bro. Uh, I, 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 space always. I've always wanted to go to space, even if it's just to go up and back down. You know, I just want to go. Yeah. You know, say I went, be up there. You know, floating around and be all like, oh, I'm floating in space, bitches. Uh, 
but it is what it is. I mean, Jesus Christ. I just think that there's a lot of bad shit that's been happening and we're on the precipice of the goodness. It's just people are going to have to really get mentally prepared. Which is kind of um, a scary thought in knowing how mentally decapitated, in a sense, we <laughs> as feel like a majority of human beings are. Yep, that's why I'm really sad. I mean, I was I had a, I had really high hopes, like for humanity and stuff, and then you know now I'm kind of like I still have high hopes or whatever. I'm just it's, not it's di- gonna... not disappointed. It's like, <sighs> I think it's just going to be a smaller group of us than I had initially hoped. <laughs> so it had to be like, a, like okay, well, we got to take a little bit more slack because the rest of these motherfuckers aren't picking up their their end. <laughs> well, it's been like that since the beginning of time, my friend. Yeah. Too many che- – it's just nowadays everybody thinks that they're a chief. But everybody forgot that, you know, like when they built the pyramids, it was one guy that knew what he was doing and then everybody else just listening to him. Mm -hmm. And then nowadays we have everybody that thinks that they know everything. And then we got guys like me who just, you know, I know a few things. But the only reason I know a few things is because I was involved in some way, shape or form. I was there. I could prove it. Right. Like, yeah. My name. Right there. It's yeah. there. The whole time. It's been there the whole time. Yeah. You know, like, and some people notice it. Some people don't. Some people are just like, you know, what the fuck were you doing there back then? I'm like, I don't know. Sounds <laughs> cool, you know? Fuck. Just like What's in wrong, the background you know? sweeping. <laughs> exactly. I'm the guy in the background <laughs> fucking sweeping. That's me. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, I'm Manny. You know, it's like. I'm I'm like that there's a movie where they did there's this guy and he shows up in all these like famous places. That's yeah. me. Yeah. You know, they'd be like, Oh yeah, you remember that one sick ass Coachella show and be like, Yeah, man, I was stage left, just standing there smoking a cigarette, but I was fucking there, man. And they're just like, Bullshit. And then I have to show them the picture and they're just like, Wait, how did you get there? And I'd be like, Honestly, you wouldn't even believe the story if I told you because it's so <laughs> it's so ridiculous. You know, they're like, how do you make these things happen? And that's the thing is, is I don't make anything happen. I ask the universe or God or whatever you want to put it, call it. Yeah. I just say, hey, it would be really cool if this could happen. You know, I don't know what we got to do or how we're going to make it happen. But, you know, let's just think about this real quick. And, you know, we'll go. You know, some people call it manifestation. I remember the first time somebody told me to manifest, like, I'll show you. (laughs) Like manifestations. So I manifested this jacket for $160, right? But it's a cool one. It's got an owl on it. It's made by one of my favorite artists that, you know, I never bought one of his paintings, but I was sitting at a friend of mine's house and I was looking at his wall and I saw this painting on his wall. And I was like, I was like, that's a sick painting. I would really love that on a hoodie. And he was just like, why don't you manifest it? And I was like, uh, he's like, well, they don't make that in a hoodie. And, uh, uh, he's never made any mention of doing it. And I was like, all right, well, I manifest that I'm going to buy that picture on a fucking at a festival on a hoodie and i'm gonna pay like 160 bucks and that's what i said shit you not i went to a festival i went to this guy's booth and i walk in there and this thing is just hanging right there and i was just like (laughs) and then i just hand the guy the money right you know (laughs) is like i walk up to it with it i'm like and he was just like i'm not even open yet and i was just like what you said you wanted 160 for this and he was like that's literally the only one of that one i have and i'm not even open and i was like well it's mine so here you go and he was just (laughs) like that's the only one of that one that I even brought. He was like, I wasn't even planning on selling it or anything like that. And I was like, well, 
I want it. So he gave it to me. And then I was just like wearing it. And all these people were like, where the fuck did you get that? That's the sickest thing I ever seen. And I kept sending people over to his booth and he was just kind of like, where did you come from? I didn't tell anybody that I was going to make these. I did not narrow no he was like i didn't even think i was gonna sell it like he had just like hung it up because he was like i don't know but he didn't know if he was ready because he only had like five of them yeah and i literally was like nah uh i was asking for this the universe for this a couple of months ago so <laughs> thanks i needed this and then, yeah. like after that i helped him sell the rest of them and he was just kind of like this is very strange because like he dealt with manifestation and I was like, yeah, I manifested it. I was like, but like manifestation isn't all it's cracked up to be. You got to be very clear about what your intention is and like what you're giving, you know, like this particular sense, it was easy. Cause I just had to say I was willing to pay the money for it. And then, you know, like somehow he got the message that somebody wanted to buy it and made it. Maybe other people were saying it before me, but it happened regardless mm -hmm. and yeah. that's the thing that i try to like get people to do you know like life is nonsense but if you understand that it's nonsense then nonsensical things like that will work like mm -hmm. nonsensical ideas and plans that should have never worked will work because you're willing to interact with the system in order to get it you know mm -hmm. think about this the next time that you're trying to create something like yeah are you just talking to yourself or are you actually interacting with your universe? And I mean, shit, is it even a possibility for you to do so? That's probably a better question. Do you have, do you think it's a possibility for you to have a communication with the universe? What does it sound like? Does it sound like anything? Is it a vibration? Is it like seeing stuff in the universe? Is it like, what is it? I think it's different for everybody, but you got to make the first step and some people already have, and they call it God. And I don't think that that's wrong. I just think there's a lot more going on. Yeah. It's a lot more nuances, a lot more complexities, all interwoven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything is just all wib timey, wimey, wibbly, wobbly space bullshit. <laughs> timey, wimey. Facts. Yeah, well, it is facts. I mean, you know, we sit here, we <laughs> bullshit it about nonsense all over this time, but, you know, like, where yeah. have we gotten to? You know, what are people going to take away from this? Yeah. I want people to take this away. Is Robert David Steele real? The answer is fucking no. <laughs> He's not. He is fake as can be. He's the fakest man alive. Robert <laughs> David Steele, <laughs> fake. And most of the people out there aren't even going to know what I'm talking about, but look them up and then be like, fake. <laughs> he's no elon musk i'll tell you that <laughs> but he is he is a man that likes to uh acquire funds from people out there in the world mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well it just kind of makes me wonder what's next for you and what's next for us for you and i What's next for us? I think only time will tell. I mean, there's only 86,400 seconds a day until the machine resets and we got to start over again. So, like, you better use it wisely. <laughs> At least that's what they, they tell you that you're supposed to do. Wisdom and discernment. Maybe. <laughs> Wisdom and discernment is one thing, but the other thing is you just got to make sure you have your guns. Have your guns. I mean, I always have my guns, but I try to do the right thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing. Manifest. Manifest your destiny. Although, do better than I did. <laughs> do better than I did. Like, that's just the thing is, you know, like I want people to do better than me, yeah. but in order to do better than me, you have to be playing on my level and getting on my level is not easy because apparently it's difficult to live like me, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's not really that difficult. You basically just got to be like a monk with computers, a computer monk. That's computer basically monk. what I am. A computer yeah. monk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, I'm just hanging out in the back, making the ale, cooking some food, being all like, 
damn, I don't know what you guys are doing, but <laughs> they'd be like, hey, it'd be really funny if you guys did this, but don't tell anybody I told you to do it because I'm a monk and this is not supposed to be going down, okay? I'm going to be sweeping. <laughs> Just going to be sweeping back here. I'm going to be sweeping. Ah, you should do it like this. Oh, nothing. <laughs> did you see this book on alchemy? <laughs> you guys see this book called Q? <laughs> Have you seen this over here? This is like the military psyop book. Just take that. Here, just take that one too. Okay, I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go make some chicken. <laughs> Throw some numbers in there. Yeah, we should use the letter letter Q. It's a good one. People like questions, and then they'll get all number twenty three to about the number seventeen. Oh, isn't that great? <laughs> seventeen intelligence agencies. Q. Hey, Q clearance. Wait, isn't there? Q, that's the guy that makes all the shit in James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it just makes me sad. And it makes me happy, but it also makes me sad. And happy. Yeah. yeah. And happy and sad. I feel it. Yeah. I feel it's that all good, too. though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I feel like we've... Uh, we should start to wind things up here. I feel like we've... Uh, we're starting to get a little loopy. Which that's I don't true. Mind. I am getting weird. I'm getting weird, but that's all right. I don't mind. I am too. It's it's good. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll. I just want to thank you, I guess, for being on the show and for exploring all this nonsense. I want to thank you for having me on this show and exploring all this nonsense because I mean, this is something that we could just go so crazy. Mm-hmm. We could go so crazy with it because people really just need nonsense, especially yeah. in times like these. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. I think I just did actually do the Foo Fighters reference. <laughs> times like these. You're welcome, Dave Grohl. <laughs> uh, That's how I learned to love again. <laughs> Our first LARP line will be in eight days. Well, well. Cool. Well, perfect, man. I appreciate you having me on the show, though, and uh, I'll definitely be looking forward to the next one. Yeah, we're going to have a few for sure. Definitely. Um, keep exploring them. Or All keep right. exploring the nonsense, you mean? Yep. Make sense of the nonsensical. Well, I don't think we made any sense of the nonsense. <laughs> I think we just talked around in circles, but, you know, I'm sure people are going to like it, right? They'll like yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, whoever's maybe. whoever's meant to like it will like it. Some people won't like it. That's fine because that's exactly what we want. Yes. Yeah. I need the Hegelian dialect. I need both sides. I need people that like it and hate <laughs> it. The only way to get it bigger is to have people fighting about it. <laughs> like you. Division. Divide Division. and conquer. Divide. Yeah, but when you're dividing, you're eventually going to have to multiply. That's true. So true. If you know your math and you know how to cheat or whatever. <laughs> or is it, is it cheating when it's the better way of doing it? Or, hmm. I don't know. Dominion. Shortcuts. Yeah. Well, the big thing is going to be this Dominion thing and the election. Dominion? Mm-hmm. Well, speak more on that. What do you mean by that? Mm. Oh, sorry. I just got distracted. What'd you say? I said, what do you mean by that dominion? Oh, the, that's the software that's oh. being used in all those states that all of a sudden the election went really weird in. Okay. Dominion. But most people probably remember it by the other name, which I think was like Sequoia or something like that. Okay. It was back a couple of years ago. There was some uh, voting shit that had happened, and it had something to do with this particular company called Sequoia. Sounds so. And then they changed their name. Oh, yeah. They changed their name to Dominion. And that's why a lot of people are kind of just like, wait a minute, isn't there something that's happening right now that just seems a little bit weird? Oh, yeah. That is very weird. Mm hmm. 
So keep that in your mind. Follow along. Let's see if Dominion pops up because if it does, that means Trump wins. If the news doesn't talk about it, then you know Joe Biden is in. Mm-hmm. Ain't mm-hmm. no more hiding for Biden. Well, I mean, he can't hide anymore. <laughs> we can try. You just got to put some of his clones out there. Biden's got clones? <laughs> <laughs> is he hang has he been hanging out with Donald Marshall or what? <laughs> Over at the cloning facility? Sorry, that's a that's a deep LARP right there that I just went into. <laughs> that that was multi levels because all the cloning facility LARP comes from a guy named Donald Marshall who claims to have gone to Don- cloning facilities with numerous individuals or whatever. It has numerous clones of himself for free. It's free clones. You got uh what's his name? What's the rapper who's cloned? Uh, Kid Boo. Yeah, Kid Boo. I think yeah, that was Kid Boo. He got that guy good. Yeah, that guy literally thought that he was a clone. He still thinks he is a clone. <laughs> He's been doing. He did an Instagram video with his clone, and they were talking to each other. So he was like talking to himself with the green screen shit. Yeah, it was. He never crossed the the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, He's like, yeah, I'm sitting here talking to my clone. See, like, yo, if you're talking to your clone, y'all need to be shaking hands. That's what someone said in the Instagram thing. They're like, oh, you better shake hands. He's like, no, we can't, man. We'll explode. Be like, wait, this isn't time cop rules. Get out of here. (laughs) A clone. We're not going back in time. He's not going to explode. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me on the show and stuff, man. 